watch it later. Okay. Um, so for those who did listen to the podcast, anybody want to offer a very brief summary of like the message of the book? So it was a discussion between a doctor named Peter Atiyah and one of his friends or maybe acquaintances, um, Bill Perkins. So it was Peter Atiyah normally he has interviews that have to do with health and fitness and longevity and lifespan but that discussion that he had brought in some other ideas and so what did you learn? Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. And it changed my perspective as well. After listening to the podcast, I invited all of my brothers to go to Europe with me. Did with, you? Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, so, okay, there's a lot to unpack in what Ben has just described. And I'm, I'm glad that he mentioned the idea of what we exchange through life is we're making bargains, exchanging our time for money and making compromises to our health so for instance, if you go to work without exercising and um, you can't do other things with the time that you spend at work, then you're prioritizing the money that you earn. But if you reduce your expenses and have to work fewer hours, then you've got more time to spend maybe golfing or with your friends or reading a book. Um, and of course, you can exchange time for health when you go to the gym or you go for a walk, but um, what you're trying to optimize according to the Bill Perkins model is fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Did you read the book? I listened to the book. I didn't read it. I listened to it. Uh, the the audio book. Is it hard to listen? Yeah, it's it is. cheap on Amazon. I think I ordered it for like 13 bucks. Oh, you got the book? Mm -hmm. Good, good. So, um, okay, so other observations from people who listened to it, like reactions. What did you learn? Uh, the idea of exchanging time, health, and money. I probably couldn't summarize it as well as Ben summarized it, but it kind of made me think about <clears throat> what, what I'm trading for experiences. Like trading money for experiences is really valuable when you're young and you actually have the stamina to, to do these things. Right. So he talked about, Bill Perkins did, gave a story of a, uh, a financial trader on Wall Street who decided to go backpacking across Europe. Was that in the interview with Peter Atia? Yeah. Remind me of that story because it's been a while since I listened to the interview, but the idea when, um, when Jake just mentioned, you know, like when you're young, how valuable it is to, to get experiences. Why is it more valuable to spend some time in Europe when you're young rather than when you're older. I believe the way that he, he summarized it was he had a friend that went. Yeah. He did not go. Right. And it was because I think he, he was working, like you said, on Wall Street at the time, and living in like a, he called it a pizza oven apartment. It was so small. And he couldn't necessarily afford it because he was, he was studying and trying to you know, get the long-term goal. Well, then his friend went to Europe and backpacked and stayed in hostels and met great people and you know, brought him his view on life and, and what he saw. And then when he got to an age where he felt that he could com com comfortably afford it, mm -hmm. he no longer necessarily, I mean, he looks like a pretty healthy guy, but he might have not felt like 
anybody else was willing to go with him or the experience would not have given him as much value as it would have when he was, say, 25. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I think one of the ways that it was talked about in the interview is if you go on like a life-changing trip at age 20 and you live to 85, then you've got 65 years to think about and appreciate and earn dividends on that. You know, like the impact that it has on your life, in the same way that there's compound interest financially, you can have compound effects through your life of certain experiences where if, for example, you get into a healthy eating habit when you're young, then you can have the benefits of that healthy eating habit through your whole life and the effects snowball. Whereas if you make that decision when you're in your late 40s like me, then you've got less time to have a positive effect. So I think that idea of like doing things when you're young because you have a whole lifetime to appreciate and benefit from them is a really important one. And so, and also you've got less responsibilities when you're young. You know, you don't have maybe the same um, like child rearing responsibilities as you might later in life or the same financial like pressures, you know, making a mortgage payment and all that sort of thing. Um, so other thoughts or observations like stories that made an impression on you from the podcast? Sid? No? One of the things that um, Bill Perkins talked about was the last time he went, was it uh, kiteboarding? Wakeboarding. Wakeboarding. So what was, what was he worried about when he was, he was trying to decide whether or not he should go wakeboarding? Like what was risk. the risk versus the reward? Yeah, because I think he said the last time he went wakeboarding, he was maybe like 60 years old or 62 or something. He doesn't look that. I was trying to figure that out. He yeah. went wakeboarding in 2008. Yeah. He was 50 at the time. Was it 50? He was 50. Okay. Since 15, no, he was 45. No, he was, I don't know. Either way, when I did the math, the age or whatever. So you were surprised he looked so young now? I thought he looked pretty young. Yeah. He was worried about getting injured. And so what he was trying to ask himself is, you know, if I don't do it now, when am I ever going to do it? Yeah, you know, like when you're 60, you can get injured. There's something wrong with his back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or maybe, uh, you know, if you had a shoulder injury, you could pull your arms out of the socket. I don't know. Um, I guess when you get older, you start to think about that. Um, but like I was thinking, so I told you that I invited all my brothers to go with me on this trip to Europe. I also invited my parents, and my dad said no, and my mom said yes. So she's coming. I already bought her ticket. Um, but I'm thinking about going, um, what's it called, uh, paragliding, when you uh, run off a mountain and you have the thing. So I've done it before. I did paragliding when I was in Nepal. And I'm thinking about, should I ask my mom if she wants to go paragliding? She's 75. So it seems risky, right? Um, but I'll let her make that decision. But it's something that, like, it would have been less risky if she did when she was 65 or 55. Less risk of a hip fracture or, you know, something going wrong. And, if, like, even less risk when you're 25, you know. There's things that you can get away with, like taking a tumble or falling or something, getting cut. It, it just, the stakes are lower when you're young. Um, so opportunity cost is something that I think a lot about. Like, if you spend an hour doing something, you can't do something else. So... I had at academic advising meetings today, and because I had so many back-to-back -back academic advising meetings, I wasn't able to grade your exams, but that's all right. I'll get them to you on Thursday. But in the same way that uh, you can't spend an hour doing something, if you save money, that means you're not spending it. And so do you remember what Bill Perkins was saying about people who die with money, like how it's, it's a pity, it's a shame? Like it means that they haven't optimized. So, like, according to Bill Perkins, what's the problem when you die with more money than zero money? You don't get to see the fulfillment in a way that it enriches others' lives that you could have enriched. So when you 
don't, you miss out on those experiences. Right. And if you're giving it to your kids, your kids are like seven at the time. Exactly. They've already worked their whole life and have their own money. Yeah, I, I mean, that's always seemed like uh, a very strange thing that um, people would pass down the inheritance to people who are themselves elderly and don't need it. You know, like, so it, you know, like, when my mom inherited money, she didn't really need it. You know, like, just hypothetically, her bank balance went from $500,000 to $700,000. It's not a life-changing thing, you know? But for a young person to get an infusion of money when they're earlier in life and are trying to maybe get an education or pay for the education of their kids, it can have more an effect. And so, um, Bill Perkins was uh, kind of making the point that if you, if you have money at the end of your life, then you should have donated it to somebody so you could see the effect it had. Or if you think about, you know, in this class we talk about the value of money now versus the value of money in the future. And all through the semester, we've learned that money is more valuable now than it is in the future. Um, partly because things will be more expensive in the future, but then also because you lose the, um, the experiences or the things that you could have done with it. It's, it's largely the opportunity cost. And so, you know, people who, who donate money to charity when they die, that's good, but they should have given it, like Bill Perkins would say, it's poorly optimized if you didn't give it to them earlier because they could have made good use of it earlier, better use than they can later. And then the, the other aspect of it, so, you know, Bill Perkins, what he'd say is if, if you die with more money than zero, then you should either donate more money or what else? What's the other way to make it so that you have less money when you die? Have more experiences. Have more experiences. So increase your expenses and reduce your income. And this is like totally contrary to the way people usually think about it. Usually we think, well, I want to keep my expenses low and my income high. But, I mean, it's good to consider things outside the box, like um, the idea, bring your income down by working less, or finding a job that doesn't pay as much money, but it's maybe more fulfilling, or it's in a place that you want to live. You know, like everyone here could make more money if we work outside of West Virginia. And maybe you're already thinking about not working in West Virginia, but, I mean, I could make more money if I lived in... Phoenix or Los Angeles or New York or Dubai. All of us could make more money than we can here, but we're willing to take a little bit less money maybe for quality of life issues or because we like the environment. And so we should be willing to make compromise that maximize fulfillment. And so don't maximize um, the amount of money in your account. So when, when Bill Perkins says die with zero, he's talking about Make it so that you have enough money, but not too much, because you want to have enough money to give yourself the experiences that you value, and enough money that you're able to help other people in a way that brings you fulfillment. But if, if you die with more than zero, then you worked too hard or you didn't spend enough. So in the project today, uh, well, the, the, the second project this semester, I'm going to give you some data that you're going to use to analyze um, how long should you be in the cubicle? How long should you work in the cubicle versus how long should you be out on the golf course or whatever you enjoy? I've never golfed a game in my life. Uh, so for me, it would be maybe running on a trail or going on a trip. Everyone here has activities that in, in your mind, you're thinking, when I retire, here's what I want to do. You know, it's, it's what I really love. And it's okay to be, you know, both excited about your career and also excited about other things. I'm not saying that each of us should, should dread our work or should be intentionally um, looking to, to stop work because work is bad. I'm just saying that maximizing income isn't as good as maximizing fulfillment. And when you're willing to make compromises in the type of job you take and the location that you're living and how long you work, then maybe you can maximize your fulfillment. So let me give you some data. Let me hand this out. I had some trouble with the printer, so I hope I've got everybody's. No, it was intentional that I did it on the big paper, 
but the double-sided was not intentional. So I hope that I printed one for everybody here. So here's your data. Here's yours. Do we all get different data? You all get different data, yes. And I did that because uh, I think it would be interesting to consider a variety of possibilities. And I'll explain the spread in the data. I feel like you might have done some research on this, Dr. Way. I'm a little, I'm a little concerned at what you have yeah. access to. Oh, you mean in terms of the salary or something? Yeah. No, no, no. This is just, it's, there's a random distribution. This isn't you. So the data that I've given you isn't you. It's a person that you are analyzing. And you're going to do a separate analysis that is you. So I guess I should say that to begin with. So um, like the starting savings and the income, this is just <clears throat> there's a certain person and you have their data here, and I want you to assess um, what would be the investment account balance if this person works until age 85. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you a, uh, a write-up that includes this information. Um, but, I mean, yeah, not bad to, you know, on the paper maybe just take a note. These are going to be, there's five scenarios that you're going to assess. And this is scenario number one. So let's look at the data that's available. Like I'm asking you the investment account balance. And what I mean by that is just to keep things simple, we're going to assume that this person only has one investment account, that all of their savings goes to the same place, even though in reality, someone maybe has a savings account and a 401k and a separate Roth IRA. Maybe they have some treasury bonds or whatever. We're just going to assume it's all in one place. So if, if the person starts in year zero with a, a certain amount of savings, and in year zero, their starting income is $64,000, um, look at some of the data that I've given you. Now, the reason why this page is so long is that through the person's 85th year, I've given you a year-by-year what you should assume for their income growth. Okay, so this person, for example, well, everyone's got different data. So I'll, I'll look at Ben. The, the person who Ben is analyzing has $64,000 at year zero. So their income in year one, he has 0% growth for year one. So they're gonna earn the same $64,000 in year one as in year zero. And 8.5% in year two means that it's 8.5% higher through year two is the income. So every year there's a different amount of percentage that the income is going up. And that's kind of like reality. Sometimes there's a lot of inflation. Sometimes there's less inflation. You may go through periods of your career where you have a big increase in your income, maybe because you get a new certification or you change jobs. But it's not always going to be the same like 3% growth per year. It's variable. And so if you look at the data in the income growth column, you'll notice that it jumps around. Sometimes you may have a 12% increase in income. Sometimes you may have a 0% increase in income. I don't think that I gave anybody a negative income growth. So for this, this first assessment, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be looking at the, uh, the income and taxes have to be taken into account. I've given you the effective income tax rate that you should assume. And that includes state and federal taxes as well as payroll taxes and everything. So um, the income minus taxes minus living expenses minus gifts and charitable donations tells you how much is available to be saved. And I, I have a formula here underneath retirement income. It says that the formula is annual amount saved is income minus income taxes minus living expenses minus gifts and charitable donations. So how much you can save every year is just the difference between in and out. The money that comes into your account, the money that goes out of your account. And so 
what you're going to effectively find out is every year how much money can you save and then how is your savings balance growing over time. Now in addition to the income changing over time, I've also told you what you should assume for your expenses. The expenses are going to be going up and it's a different amount every year and every student here has different values for how the living expenses are going up. You know, you may have a year where you've got 0% increase in living expenses. There are years where the uh, living expenses go up by as much as, I think the maximum, there's a 9.8% for, for some people. Um, so that would be like last year for us. You know, inflation was really high last year. Yeah, 0% raise and 9% increase of expenses. That was this year for me. Marshall does not do cost of living adjustments, <laughs> but inflation sure still happens. Um, okay, now the rate of return on savings, you'll notice fortunately for you, um, savings has a pretty good rate of return. The average is higher than inflation. So what that means is that your savings account balance can increase over time. Um, one other thing to mention is that I've given you, everybody has different assumptions on what to use for retirement income. So if the person retires, then they can take the equivalent in that year of the amount that's listed. So it says 2000 per month today for the person that Ben is analyzing and it grows at 2% per year. So their monthly retirement would actually be like if they work until age 85, I guess we assume that they die at 85. So there wouldn't actually, in scenario one, there would be no use of the retirement income. It's just what you're doing is every year you're calculating the investment account balance by looking at the in, the out, and the growth of the investment account balance. And maybe I should uh, point out the, the formula let me bring it up on the screen so that you can see the formula. Uh, okay, this formula, let me zoom in on it. The investment account balance in any given year is last year's, last year's balance times the rate of return on savings. So this, uh, this amount is how much growth you had. It's kind of like the interest that you earned. So how much is in your, your savings account is the interest based on last year's balance plus last year's balance plus how much you saved this year. So if you think about this hypothetical person, uh, we're looking at Sean's data. So they start with 5,500. By the way, some people start with a negative value and that would just represent like student loans or maybe an auto loan or something. And so, you know, probably more people leave college with a negative savings account than a positive one because of loans. So um, how much you're gonna have at the end of some future year is last year's account balance times the rate of return, so that gives you the interest amount, plus last year's balance, plus the amount that you saved this year. So the living expenses are going up over time. You can see that there's a, a percentage growth for everybody's living expenses. Um, so what questions do you have so far? Before we even move on to the uh, second scenario, do you have any questions just based on the handout that I've given you? Okay, so scenario one is like a miserable life scenario because the person works until 85. Ben, do you have a question? Yeah, so like... Well, never mind. No, okay. All right. They don't get to spend anything. Well, they spend it on necessities. Yeah, but they're not drawing down their savings balance in scenario one. Yeah, they're just saving for the future that never arrives. Till they're 85. Till they're 85. That's scenario one. Scenario one, they never heard the podcast. Okay. Scenario two, 
is um, do the calculations for the investment account balance over time if the person retires at 67. So what that means is that they are working until 67 and then they retire. When they retire, they begin to draw the retirement income and then their expenses are likely to exceed the retirement income and so they're going to have to begin drawing down the savings balance. And so what that means is that the formula actually gets a little bit more complicated. So in scenario two, the investment account balance for scenario two is last year's investment account balance times the rate of return on savings plus last year's investment account balance. And so instead of adding the amount saved every year, you're subtracting out the the amount that you need to spend to cover your expenses. Like how much does the, I guess this retirement income, we could call it social security. So how much does social security not cover? Because chances are that your expenses are gonna be higher than what social security covers. So you're gonna have to draw down some of the savings balance in scenario two. And so what I'd like you to do is, you know, create a table that shows year, age, the, um, the retirement income that's coming in, the expenses, and then how much is being spent from the savings account and what is the savings account balance. So do we assume that our expenses will not change unless it's based on the inflation or the growth? Yes. Yeah, for scenario two, you assume that this, this baseline living expenses that I've given you, that like that distribution stays constant through the person's life. That sounds okay. What's that? That sounds good. Miserable? Having well, a house plan until you're 85? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of people live in apartments or like even if you're, uh, you don't have a, mortgage any longer, you know, there could be repairs or someone might add a vacation home or buy a motor home, but you know, it's, it's a simplification just to, to not get lost in that finer detail. So we, what we can really focus on, like one and two is kind of setting the groundwork for the more interesting questions that gets at, get asked in three and four. So one and two is preparation. Looking at the miserable life, the usual life, and then three is a little bit more interesting. Um, three is how early can you retire and then die with zero? So what that means is that we're trying to figure out, instead of retiring at 67, can you retire at 60, draw the retirement income, and spend your savings? So how far early can you retire and then draw things down to zero? Assuming that the expenses are, are defined by like what's given and the growth over time, um, income growth applies until you retire. So after you retire, your income switches over to the retirement income. And then you don't get any increase in uh, your income. The retirement income increases at 2% per year. Is that even while you're working or does that start once you retire? No, it, it starts now. So let's say that like right now, retirement income is $2,000 a year. So if you only work for 10 years, then it would be uh, $2,000 per month plus one plus I, 0 0.02 to the power of 10. So like your monthly retirement income after 10 years would be 1.02, uh, let's see, 1.02 to the 10th power, 2,000. So in, t in 10 years, it's 2438 is the monthly retirement income. So I intentionally made the growth of the retirement income less than everything else because that's reality. I mean, Social Security generally does 
get cost of living adjustments, but it's a little bit lower than actual inflation. So I think that you're going to have to draw upon the, uh, the savings to die with zero. So you won't just be able to only spend your retirement income. You'll have to use both. Would you not have to change 2000 to a yearly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the yearly would be 2400 But, I mean, this was on a monthly basis. Would so it, is, that, is that correct, though? It, would that actually give you an accurate? It both, it's, it's accurate both ways. Okay. So in 10 years, you're going to get the, what did I calculate, like $2,400 a month? $2,438. $2,438 per month. If we had said uh, $24,000 per year, and we multiply it by that factor, it's going to be the, the so annual amount but the, the, the factor multiplier is the same. But I mean, to put it into the table, you're going to have to convert from monthly to year. So that's true. Um, because everything else is on an annual basis in this table. The living expenses, the gift and charitable donations, all of that is annual basis. The only thing that is monthly is the retirement income. Okay, so question three is just you know, how soon can this person retire? Which is, I think, interesting, you know? Can they retire at 50? Can they retire at 40? I hope I've set the math up that they can't retire too early. You know, like, if, it, if this says, oh, they can retire at 35, then probably I was too generous with the uh, rate of return on the savings. But I don't know. I haven't solved it yet. I'm going to solve it. I'll solve it for everybody. So there is a right answer for one, two, three, and four. Um, and so I'll know if, if you did it correctly. And just like with the first project, if you want to check with me once you've done your calculations, I'm happy to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. You know, like it doesn't have to be an all or nothing, all at once kind of a submission. So any questions so far about the first three scenarios? OK, scenario four, I think, is even more interesting than three. Um, what if you work until age 67 and you want to die with zero at age 85? The way you're going to die with zero instead of retiring early is you're going to increase your gifts and charitable donations. So maybe that means donating to a church or to a university or to your family members. Just you're giving money away. How much can you give away to die with zero at age 85? Now, this is complicated because the, uh, in the first three scenarios, you'll notice that there's no column that says gifts and charitable donations are going up over time. The gifts and charitable donations is constant every year for the first three scenarios. On scenario four, the... Uh, you're going to be solving for like how much would it be every year, a constant amount. So it's like an annual series. You're solving for A. What would be the recurring annual amount that you can give away? Um, and you're giving the money away even before you retire. So you're giving, up, you're giving away the, um, the money from year zero all the way through 85. So solve for that amount. And of course, Goal seek is going to be helpful, right? Because the objective is in year 85, cumulative savings balance should be zero. So you're setting up Excel, you're saying change your donation amount until the savings amount in year 85 is zero. So it can do that, but there's going to be a lot of dependencies. It's going to be changing the amount up at the top of the spreadsheet, but then the savings every year is going to be impacted by how much uh, you're giving away. So any questions about these first four scenarios, which is for a hypothetical person? It's not you. Question five, scenario five is you. So you will have done this just according to my instructions, you know, with the years that I say. And now five, I want you to uh, optimize your own fulfillment and use your actual savings amount, your 
anticipated income if you have an idea of what maybe your career is going to pay when you start. Now, still use my provided assumptions for income growth, expense growth, and rate of return because you can't just use a, a constant every year you're going to make the same rate of return. You know, there's variability in the world. And uh, so the provided distribution of data is as good a guess as anything of what's going to happen in the future. Um, but then you can also fur further personalize it by picking your own year of retirement. So this is going to be iterative. You're going to say, well, if I retire at 62, do I die with zero? Do I uh, retire at age 50? And also, you're going to change your expenses to suit your own preferences. So you don't have to die with zero by giving it all away. And you don't have to die with zero by retiring early. If you want, you can die with zero by increasing your spending on yourself. You know, like you can turn up how much you spend on travel, turn up how much you spend on food, whatever your interests are, you know, dial that all in to maximize your fulfillment. But it's just basically like uh, an illustration of what you would do in this hypothetical where you truly aren't going to leave anything to your heirs at the end. You know, you would have given them the money earlier on. And you can put that into your plan as well. Like you don't have to do the same charitable donations every year. Like in the first four scenarios, um, you can say, I, you know, at age 60, I'll give each of my kids $10,000. At age 70, I'll give Marshall University Civil Engineering Department $100,000. You know, whatever you want to do, you can, um, you can have the flexibility for that. So any questions about these five scenarios? Should we assume a like standard income and expenses? Because that's going to be variable throughout our lives. What you should do is you should, you're right, it will. Um, hmm. And, and, and you know, you could go through phases, right? Like you could go through the period of your life when you have no dependents, the period of your life where you're married and maybe dual income but no dependents. There could be when your wife or other spouse starts uh, stops working and now you've got kids. And so, I mean, you can, you can choose. Like as far as your expenses, like you can either use the percentages that I've given for uh, expenses or you can adjust it. You can make like those manual adjustments, whatever you prefer. I hope so. This is, I mean, for, I th Ben, you took engineering economy from me as an undergrad. Yeah. I think you're the only one in here that did. Victor, did you? Yeah. I did. Okay. So you did a project similar to part hoping, five. I was hoping when I saw it on the syllabus that it was the same. same. It's not the same, but I mean it rhymes in certain ways. It, it, one of the, the main formula that you need to know is the same. The the formula. This one investment account balance. I'll illustrate that in a minute. How you do it on the spreadsheet. Do you have a question? When is the deadline? Oh, deadline. Let's pull up the syllabus and take a look because I think I've got it on there. The project is due on Thursday, April 20th. So you've got more than three weeks. I think. Let's see. April 20th. Yep. And then our exam will be the following Tuesday. Okay. So let me just do an illustration. Since we still have time, let me do an illustration uh, to demonstrate how to use these two formulas. Okay, so I'm just going to create another copy at the end here. Oh, I did not intend for that. <laughs> I'm not sure what just happened. I must have had multiple uh, files selected and copied them all. So let me just delete all these and keep this one. Okay. Um,
income, expenses. So let's say that in year zero, we're doing Sean's data here. The income for year zero for Sean is 62,750. That's how much that person that he's analyzing is making in their first year. Their expenses, uh, I guess I'm gonna be more specific about this. I'm gonna do it in the order that's described here too. There's income, then income taxes. There is living expenses. gifts and charitable donations. And then I'm going to create a column that is annual uh, amount saved. Okay. So his income taxes is said to be 15% of income. So 0.15 times the income. And this is year zero. So like, I guess, at the, uh, if I say year one would be like at the end of the first year, um, the end of the first year is period one. So you would have saved the money at the end of the first year. So the living expenses is gonna be the sum of, here is his living expenses for the year, and the gifts and charitable donations is this amount, so then the amount that this person is saving is the income minus the taxes, minus the living expenses, minus gifts and charitable donations. Okay, so they're able to save $14,007.50. That's how much they save. And we're just gonna, for sake of simplicity, we're gonna set aside, you know how in a 401k there's employer match. We're gonna set that aside we're not going to worry about how much of that that's saved is going into a tax deferred account versus a taxable account. We'll just assume that it's a tax deferred account, that the only tax that you're paying is on the 15% effective tax on your income, and then there's also property tax. But we're not going to worry about taxes on the savings. Okay, so the amount saved, and I guess this is the amount saved this year. So there's also going to be the uh, cumulative savings balance, investment account balance. Are we going to account for taxes when we take it out of retirement? No, we're not. We are not. Okay, so the investment account balance, um, at the end of the first year, he had 5,500 was how much was there before. So it's the 5,500 starting balance plus this $14,007.50 plus he earned interest on this starting balance of 5,500. So the starting balance times the interest amount that applies for this year, 6.7%. Okay, so if I just look at the formula here, it's the investment account balance times the interest rate, last year's balance, and how much was saved this year. Something tells me I may have a mistake here. Is this, uh, uh, it's, <laughs> it's not as a percentage. So I need to have, uh, this divided by 100. That is more reasonable. Okay, so let's just, let's ask ourselves, does the amount make sense? So 5,500 plus, if you've got your calculator handy, 5,500 plus the amount like just from this year that is saved, 14,007 and 50 cents. So you add that together and it's 19,507. And this is showing more than that because you earned a little bit of interest on the 5,500 that you had at, even before you started working. Okay, now in the next year, the income is higher. So the income for the next year is the previous year's income plus the previous year's income times this 
interest rate divided by 100. So how much is the income in the next year? $68,083.75. And that's 8.5% higher than last year. So does everybody see how the income has gone up? Could you go over that one more time? Mm -hmm. So it's got last year's amount plus the increase. So I've got this percent divided by 100 because I expressed the percent here. It, it says percent, but it's just a whole number, 8.5. So I have to divide it by 100 to turn it into a percentage and then multiply it by last year's amount. Okay, so the taxes is still going to be this times 0.15. So that you earn more money, your taxes go up. Living expenses is last year's living expenses plus last year's living expenses times the living expense increase divided by 100. So the living expenses went up a little bit, right? Last year was 38,080. This year it's 1.2% higher. Now, the gifts and charitable donations, like if we were doing analysis one, um, analysis one, gifts and charitable donations stays the same. Analysis two stays the same. Actually, uh, all four scenarios, well, hold on a second. Okay, no, four is where the, the donations increase. So scenarios one through three, this person is always going to be donating the same amount every year. Okay. Now, how much do you save? Let's see, am I ready to drag this formula down? I think so. I can just drag that down. You save more because you're earning more, and your expenses went up a little, but not as much as your income, so you're saving more. Now, your investment ba balance, just because uh, I think it's important, let me demonstrate that one again. I, I'll be able to drag the formula down, but let me just demonstrate. So your investment account balance is last year's balance, so I'm following the formula, the same order that the formula is saying here. So last year's balance times the rate of return on savings. Ooh, this is going to be a good one, 15.8%. That's nice. Okay. Plus last year's account balance plus how much was saved this year. Oh, by 100, yes. I really am digging myself into a grave by not expressing that as a decimal to begin with. Can't you Thank just you. change that whole column to percentage too? I'd have to type in the numbers separately. That's what I should do. But if I, if I format it as percentage, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was, my, it was my laziness. I should have just uh, typed it in as a percentage to begin with. But I can also just divide by 100. That doesn't break the bank. Sure, I could add another column. Yes, I could do that. Okay, so the investment balance is growing. What would most people do when they got this much money? They, they start spending more. So that's why these first few scenarios are a little unrealistic, is it's assuming that, you know, that these expenses are only changing according to inflation and not according to what's known as hedonistic adaptation. Hedonistic adaptation is that like if you have nice clothes then you get accustomed to that and you need even nicer clothes. Or you know if you have a Toyota the next year you want a Lexus and the year after that you want a BMW you know you're always looking for something more expensive. So this doesn't take that into account but that's okay. It's just an illustration and you can take that into account in scenario five. But does, does everybody understand how to use these two formulas now that I've demonstrated it in the spreadsheet? Okay. Well, remember, I'll post this video on YouTube. It'll be by far my most boring YouTube video for the semester in this class, just talking only about the project. But uh, occasionally, when I post videos like this, people will say, hey, can you send me the project? I want to do it too. Just like randos out there. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had somebody who wanted to do the hydraulics project this semester. I don't know where they are, who they are, but yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I've watched every single YouTube video. Well, good. How many subscribers are you at? Like, what, 12,000? That's a lot. That's it. Well, I try not to get too uh, worked up about it because Dr. Michelson has like triple what I do. He is the, the real YouTube champion in this college. But I've got uh, 19,000. Only 19,000. I mean, he's got like 60,000, honestly. So, but he doesn't monetize as good as me. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, that's the project. I'm going to put a very brief write-up about this on Blackboard, and I'll email it to you. And, I mean, it's going to explain these same five scenarios. And um, it's just going to talk a little bit more about how the final report should be formatted. And obviously, I'm going to want the spreadsheet that you prepare that includes these analyses. You'll probably want to have at least you know, like five separate tabs. If you want to get really in depth with like projecting your expenses, then, um, then you can do that however you like for, for uh, analysis five. Ben? Why are we not making into the town compound interest? Is it because the, the interest rate is variable and not fixed? No, we are taking compound interest into effect. We are. Let me show you. So we well, weren't multiplying by the year, were we? We don't need to because we're doing it year by year. year, by year. Yeah. So compound interest is when you earn interest on top of interest, right? Yeah. So. So like this year, right here, this value, the 8.5% interest that you're, no, no, the 15.8% uh, interest includes the interest that you earned in the previous year. So you're earning interest not only on how much you saved, but also on last year's interest because it's all accumulating in the, uh, the balance on a year-by-year -year basis. So the only difference like say we didn't have the cumulative balance we just did the year by year balance and then we would multiply that by the year itself and then sum that up so you're saying like it wouldn't be compound interest if so like if if uh, well, what I was saying is like so we're accounting for the previous Mm -hmm. So if you did not account for the previous year, if you just did, say, that year, then you would have to multiply by the year itself the compound and then sum it up, and it should be the same value, right? Hmm. It might be, way, it might be possible to get the same answer that way. But like, if you think about in reality, what's happening is you're getting a statement every year. And your statement is going to have an account balance. And that account balance is going to say how much you put in this year, what was your rate of return, you know, like what was the prior year statement, what was the rate of return on the prior year's investments. So, I mean, like, I think this year by year, step by step way of calculating it is pretty close to like a realistic description of it, more so than saying like one plus i to the n power would be. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So Thursday, we're going to have a quiz about that podcast. So I'll have some points of trivia. I'll ask you to explain some story from the podcast. Victor. Uh, can I see the equation in upper that one? No, in the investment account balance. Yeah. Not that one. The... I have a question. The above one. Like the first, year the first year. one. Yeah, the first one's a little more simple because it's only including the starting savings plus how much you saved this year, and the starting savings are getting the interest. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. It's um, not relevant to this, but kind of okay. is. Okay. So say you make $100,000 a year, uh -huh. whatever. 
Let's say me and Ben bet on something random that there's a red car that passes by and we bet $50,000. Mm. Do you have to report that as your income? Yeah. What, so what, what amount of that bet do you have to report? Any amount? Yeah, there's a place on your taxes where you report gambling winnings or losses. And so they specifically ask, how much did you win or lose with gambling? And... Um, but if you keep it in cash and just put it on like gas and <laughs> Which I, I'm like, so I don't understand how two is, say you, you're making $100,000. Yeah. And you get taxed with that money. And then you use that money to gamble. You're gonna get taxed again? If you, well, if you win, uh, like if you make extra money. So let, like if you gamble 50,000 and you get 60, your net increase was 10, so you pay taxes on the 10. You, okay. don't, you don't pay taxes on the 60. Okay. okay. Yeah, because you had 50 at stake to begin with. Does betting, does betting GMs have tax forms? Yeah, after, you, after a certain amount of money that you win. Huh, interesting. I've always been intrigued because, you know, the commercials, they always say, you know, like, deposit $1,000 and get $1,000 in free bets. I was thinking, seems like you could really come out ahead if you just, no, you do. Right. if you just made the bets and say, I'm never gambling again. I'm just taking the money out, you know? Did that for $1, really? Not me, though, my friend. That's great. Yeah. That, I think the key is to get out when you're ahead, right? For sure. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, that's all for today. We'll have uh, more on Thursday, including that quiz. So if you didn't listen to the podcast yet, please do it.